Okay, in this video we're going to solve a little math problem, but the goal of the video is not to talk about solving math problems. It's more to discuss some ways to plan your work before you start writing code. Now most of us love when we see we have a problem we have to code, we jump right in start writing code. And in my experience it's very, very easy if you do that to start down a road and get into what I call a rabbit's hole and working on something and working and working and you finally found out, hey, wait a minute, I shouldn't be doing this. This is not very efficient and I got some problems and hey, I should have thought about this and this isn't going to work and you have to erase what you were doing and start all over again. So the goal here is to, to look at some ways to step back and really plan out your work first. And that applies to any time you have a problem, not just uh, writing software. Um, plan out your work, think about it first, even though it may not seem like a lot of, as much fun as just writing code. It really can help you in the long run, and especially if you're working for someone, you don't want to be, you know, doing something that ultimately is going to waste a lot of time and a lot of their time and going to end up with errors. You want to plan stuff out and do it right the first time if you possibly can. So what we'll do is we'll start out with a new project, C Sharp. It'll be a simple console application. And we're going to name it Math Problem. And here we've got our standard console application, static void main. And let me show you what the equation is that we're going to solve. Here's the equation. And if you recall from your math class, this shows 2 raised to a power of 1 and 2 raised to a power of 2, 2 to the 3, and so on. And in some cases, I'm adding these two, and then I'm multiplying, and then I'm adding, and multiplying, and adding, and multiplying, and so on. And we'll probably set it up so that we have, we can vary these numbers here um, to make it useful for, you know, not just 2 to the 7th, but we can vary it 3 to the 20th if we want. So <clears throat> the first thing I like to do when I'm writing a, some sort of application is think about has somebody already done part of my work for me? In other words, are there some references out there? Are there any libraries out there that either, either I've written uh, in the form of a, uh, a personal or private DLL file, a uh, dynamic link library, that already does some of this functionality? Or maybe there's some .NET um, libraries out there that I can refer to that have done some of this math stuff already. Uh, if there is, you can go to the Solution Explorer here on the right, click on References, right-click, Add Reference, and you can select whatever DLL or whatever, whatever other reference you want to use, and you can bring that in and use that in your application. In this case, if you look at this, it's fairly standard math stuff that's already included in the math libraries that come with the system. Uh, so I don't think we'll need it, but it's a good um, practice to get into. Uh, think about if somebody's already done your work for you, and you can just reference their, their libraries. So next thing we need to do is take a look at this problem and, and get a plan of attack how we can solve it in the most efficient way. We see that we've got a base number, which in this case is 2. So let's start writing out base num equals 2. And we're raising that to an increasing power. So let's call that variable power equals 1 to 7. Okay? And we are calculating 2 raised to the power. Okay? So we see that we've got 2 raised to an increasing power. And we're starting to say, hey, we can loop through here and increase this power number and raise 2 to that power number. But we also have to keep in mind, in some cases we're adding two elements, in some cases we're multiplying the two elements, and it changes. We got add and then multiply, then add, then multiply. We have a equation that is going to be probably a for loop, right? I equals 1, 2, 7, and we want to calculate 2 raised to power. 
Okay, so we think we can do a for loop and calculate each of these intermediate elements. We can actually put each of these intermediate uh, two raised to the powers into an array, and we can store them and work on them later. So let's call that powers, and that's the array of these results. Well, we also need to multiply or add the elements depending on where we are. So, how are we going to do that? Um, well, we can think about, my first thought is to take these two values, and then these two values, and these two values, calculate them, and stick them in a different array. So we can do an array of mults that stores the result of this multiplication, and another element that stores this multiplication, and then this multiplication. And really, once we've got those elements, we can go through and add all of those individual elements in the mults array and get our answer. Aha! Uh -huh. So, um, that's good. We've got the, the basic uh, framework of this solution. Now we just need to figure out how we're going to do it. So, the first thing we need to figure out, how do we calculate 2 to a power? What is there um, in the existing system math libraries in the .NET framework that will do that? Well, luckily, there is a function called math.pow, and you feed it base num, gosh, I can't type today, base num and power. So what it will do, use this function, it will take two or the base num and, and raise it to whatever power you're at. So we've got basically these two to the power elements, we just need to feed it into the powers array. Good, okay, so once we've got each of these powers into the array, what else do we need to do? Well, um, we're going to need to put these multiples into the mults array. So how do we do that? Well, if we look at this, we can see that the multiplication is between an, uh, this number and this number, and then this number and this number. And what distinguishes those are, this is, starts out with a 2 to the 3 times a 2 to the 2. When we get to calculating 2 to the 2, we could multiply it times 2 to the 3, but if you think about it, if we're, multi if we're calculating 2 to the 2, this 2 to the 3 hasn't been calculated yet. So it's best to wait until we get to 2 to the 3 and then multiply it times the previous element. And the same thing with this 2 to the 5. Wait till we get to, to this 2 to the 5 and multiply times 2 to the 4, and so on. How do we know that we're at this 2 to the 3 element? Well, we can see that the difference is this is an odd number, and this is an odd number, this power, and this is an odd number. Aha! So if we wait until we're calculating 2 to the 3, and then multiply it times the previous element, we can just take that answer and stick it into the mults array. And then wait until 2 to the 5 times the previous element and stick that in the mults array. So if we wait, wait until 2 raised to the 3, then calculate for every odd power and put in mults array. And once we've got that, we can just add the elements of the mults array and we've got the answer. To show that, what I'll do is show you um, one thing that I think is very important and I've done here is I've calculated the value. So I know the answer before I even run the code. So when I do a debug, I already know what to look for in the arrays because I've already figured out the answers. So in this case, I've gone through and I've actually done the calculations. And this first line below the equation shows what I should expect in the powers array. 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 to the 2 is 4, 2 to the 3 is 2 times 2 times 2 or 8, and so on. So this shows what I should expect in the powers array. 
And then in the Maltz array, I should get 2 to the 3 times 2 to the 2, which is 4 times 8, or 32. So one element of the Maltz array should have 32, the next should have 512, and then 8192, which is 2 to the 6 times 2 to the 7th. And if I then add those Maltz array elements, I should get 8738. So good, it looks like we're all set, except for if we're going to wait till the odd elements, the odd powers, how do we know we're at an odd power? Huh. So how do we decide if the power number is odd or even? Well, if you recall from your math, there is an operator called the mod operator, and that looks like this called a modulus operator. And what a modulus operator does, I'll give you an example. For example, 4 mod 2, what is that? Well, the modulus operator defines what remainder is left after you divide two numbers. So for this example, if I divide 4 by 2, what is the remainder of that operation? Well, 4 divided by 2 is 2, and that's clean. There's no, op there's no remainder. So the answer is there is no remainder. Now let's take 5 mod 2, and what's the answer to that? Well, 5 divided by 2 is 2, which is 4, with a remainder of 1. So the remainder here is 1. Now let's take, for example, 8 mod 2. What's the, what's the answer here? 8 divided by 2 is 4, and there's no remainder. Let's take one more example. 17 mod 2 equals what? Well, 17 divided by 2 is 8, which gives you 16, and, then, and it, uh, there's a remainder of 1 because you've got 17. So 17 mod 2 is 1. So if you look at this, you can see that for the even numbers, 4, 8, the modulus uh, result is 0. For the odd numbers, the modulus operator is 1. So now we have a way to calculate for every odd power. Uh, we know how to calculate the power. We use math.power. So we just calculate the powers, put them in the powers array, multiply times the previous power, and stick that result in the Maltz array. Now, one little side note I wanted to mention about this modulus operator. We're using it in a very simple application, but in the real world, it's used in some very interesting areas, such as cryptography. You can use the modulus operator to generate some very unpredictable and difficult-to-break codes and keys that um, it forms the basis of a lot of cryptography out there. So it's an interesting thing to get uh, to get to know and understand. So it looks like we're pretty much all set to go. So the point here is that we haven't even started writing code, but we know the answer. We know what all the rays are going to be. We know where we're going. We've got our variables pretty much laid out. We know we're going to need a for loop. We figured out how we're going to calculate the power, how we're going to calculate the um, odd or even powers. So writing the code becomes a lot easier, a lot clearer, and we're all set to debug because we've already got the answers to look for when we do, do a debugging. So now we can start writing code. Now we've already defined two variables, our base number and our power. So we can say double base num equals 2, and we can change that. We can have the user input that value if we want to change it, but right now we'll just set it as a 2. And then for the power, we say int, uh, and let's call it max power because it is the final value of power. And in this case, we've got 7. And we also know we have to define two arrays. One is powers and one is malts. So we'll say they're arrays of doubles. So double, double, array powers equals new double. 
And how big is that array going to be? Well, right now it's going to be as big as max power. So let's say max power. And we'll do the same for the mults. Double mults equals new double and max power. So we also decided we're going to need a for loop in here somewhere where we calculate 2 to the power. We'll do a for tab tab, and that gives us the uh, code snippet. So for i equals 0, i less than max power powers i equals, and we said we're going to use math.power, and we can actually copy and paste it up here, math.power, and we're using base num, which we already find, and power. Power we're going to have to define now. Um, recall we're, we're going from 2 to the 1 to 2 to the 7th, but our array index here of, of i is going from 0 to 6. So we can say power equals i plus 1. We'll call that a double, because you'll see in here, if you look at the IntelliSense for math.power, it takes two doubles as arguments, double x and double y. So power and base num need to be doubles. So now we're all set. Now, we also said that <clears throat> we need to calculate this, this MULTS array. And we want to wait until we get to 2 to the 3, or 2 to the 5, or 2 to the 7th, to calculate the mults. So how do we do that? Well, we can use an if statement and say if power greater than 2, which brings us to the 2 to the 3rd, and power, we have to use the mod operator, power mod 2 equals 1, which tells us that it is a odd number. Then we can say mults i equals powers i times powers i minus 1. Okay, and in this case, we are doing 8 times 4. We're filling 32 into the mults. 32 times 16, we get 512 into the mults, and so on. So, now we've got all the mults figured out. We've got all these values figured out. All we need to do is add them, and we're going to get the answer of the 8738. Though we have to keep in mind we've got this lone uh, 2 to the 1 that we haven't included. We're going to have to add that later. But to do this, to sum the elements, as we loop through, we can say sum equals sum plus mults, mults, I. Now we will have to define double, uh, sum as a double, sum, and we can say equals zero, even though we don't need to. So right now we've got the, the answer is basically this sum is the answer to this problem, except for, recall we need to say sum equals sum plus two to account for this lone remaining uh, value. Also, if we want to make this, if we want the user to change this base num from two to something else, we can say that this is base num instead of a fixed two. And the same thing goes for this power. We can change that to base num, but you get the point. Um, so now we've got the answer, and all we need to do is set it up to write the answer. So we'll do console write line, which is CW is the code snippet. OK, dude. The final answer is, and we'll say this, and sum gives us the final answer. And we also need to stop the console window. We need to pause it. So console.read key, and we should be all set. The important thing here is we went through and we 
did all our work up front. We thought about it. We planned it out without writing code because it's easy to get into the code and get lost in your for loops and your ifs. And if you do it this way and you also calculate the answer you're expecting, you make it a lot easier on yourself if you really think about it in advance. And also, more importantly, you figure out the answers so that when you, if you do have to do the debug and you have some problems, you've already got the answers and you know where you're going. So um, let's run through it and see if we get the right answer. We'll start. Okay, dude, the final answer is 8738. Is that correct? Well, we already got the answer, and yes, it is 8738. So again, I encourage you to think about planning your work before you do it, and that's not just with software development. Anytime you get a, a challenging problem, plan it out, think about it, figure out whatever references you might need. Maybe somebody's done the work before you, or you've done the work before, and you can just use your old work and reference to it. So I hope this has been helpful, and see you later. Have a good day.